So in my last video I went over the frequency response, which is solving the Laplace transform along the imaginary s-axis, and we can use this to get a good sense for how a system will respond to inputs of different frequencies. So in this video I'm going to actually go through an example using the geometric approach for finding the frequency response, and I will look at both the magnitude and the phase. Uh, depending on how long this takes, this might get cut into two separate videos. For this example, I've chosen a transfer function h of s, and uh, this is one that has both uh, at least one zero and one pole, so that we get uh, some practice with using zeros and poles when finding the magnitude and the phase of a transfer function. And so the transfer function that we're working with is s plus 0 0.5 over s squared plus 4s plus 8. And so directly from this uh, transfer function we have us already written as a ratio of polynomials and if we find the roots of those polynomials we know the what the zeros and the poles will be for the system so the zeros will be the the roots of the numerator and so we know that the numerator will equal zero when s is equal to negative 0 0.5 so we know that this system has a zero located at s equals negative 0 0.5 and we have this quadratic in the denominator. And if you solve this quadratic, you would find then that we have two poles. And the locations of those poles are both to the left of the imaginary s-axis. And they're at s equals minus 2 plus or minus 2 times j. So j because this is, uh, this is the imaginary component. Since the real component of these poles um, is negative, that would then mean that this is a stable system. So already we can talk about the stability of the system. Um, so we needed to find the zeros and poles in order to use the geometric approach for determining the, uh, the frequency response, being able to plot that. And so what I'm going to do now is actually plot in the s domain uh, the poles and zeros. And I'm going to do that on a fairly large space here that, so that we have some room for being able to include everything. So I'm going to write this out here. I don't need much space in the positive real because everything is uh, negative. So we have an, our imaginary axis, we have our real axis. Uh, I'm going to switch the colors here so we can say that we're going to draw our zero as uh, here in blue. That's going to be at s equals minus 0 0.5. So we can draw our zero right here zeros are drawn as a circle. And then our poles, I'll do those in red. We have our poles at negative 2 plus or minus 2j. So we write those as x's. So we have one there and one there. And just to be clear, we can say that this is at minus 2, minus 2j. And this is at minus 2, plus 2j. Since we've drawn these directly on the coordinates, you could also omit these j's, since they would be implied um, by the coordinate system that we're using here. So we'll start with trying to find the magnitude of this particular transfer function. And then for the frequency response, this is solved along this imaginary s-axis. So we basically just consider different values of frequency omega. So we just consider s equal to j omega. And in principle, you could plot uh, any arbitrarily large number of points. Since we're doing this by hand with the geometric approach, I'm just going to pick three different test frequencies. And obviously, the more frequencies you use, uh, the more accurate of a curve that you could then sketch uh, to show that magnitude. But just to be keep things simple, we're just going to work with three frequencies. Now, what are good frequencies to pick? Quite often, it's useful to pick frequency zero and frequency infinity, or at least as the frequency is tending towards infinity. And then if you pick another finite frequency in between those, we try to look for one that will be either easy to solve or one that might be quite important for describing the behavior of the system. So the three frequencies I'm going to work with will be zero. I'll work with infinity, so where the frequency is arbitrarily high. And I'm also going to look at frequency omega equal to two. And I do that because the frequency omega equal to two will mean that we have a vector from this pole will be horizontal, so that'll be a bit easier to work with. Uh, so that's a good one for working out uh, this type of 
a problem by hand. We're going to make a table for the magnitudes. So our first column will be the different omegas that we pick. Then for each omega, we're going to find uh, the magnitude of the zero vector. There's only one zero, so we're going to have one zero vector. We're going to have two pole vectors, so we need to find the magnitude of pole vector one. We need to find the magnitude of pole vector two. And then once we have these three vectors, we'll then be able to work out the magnitude of h of omega. So we're going to make a, a short table here. I haven't actually labeled the individual poles, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to call this one up here pole one, and this one down here pole two, just for consistency so we can make sure that everything is being done correctly. Um, here in the table. Okay, so we picked our two, our three frequencies. We're going to work with frequency zero radians per second. We're going to work with two radians per second. And we're also going to pick infinity. And uh, for the infinity, I like to write that as we want to say the limit as omega tends towards infinity. So for each of these frequencies now, we basically need to consider three different vectors which come from our poles and zeros and they all point to that test frequency. So I'm going to actually write, I'm going to sketch um, for omega equal to zero. I'll actually write it out explicitly here on our pole zero plot. We say we have this vector here that goes from the zero, from the location of the zero to coordinate zero, the frequency zero along this imaginary s-axis. We're going to have two pole vectors, one coming down there from pole two, and this one here coming from pole one. So these are vectors that start at the pole and zero, and then they point to the imaginary s-axis at the frequency that we're considering. So they all start, uh, pole two starts here, for pole one we start here, from the zero we start here. The, for the magnitude, the direction doesn't really matter, but when we're working at the phase, the direction matters quite considerably. So for frequency zero, the magnitude of this zero vector is just uh, it's just a line along the real s-axis that goes from here, the coordinates are minus 0 0.5, zero, going to here to zero, zero. So the length of that vector is just going to be 0 0.5. For our two pole vectors, we have symmetry. They're the same length, um, so that makes it convenient to work with them uh, at frequency zero. We can say that the length of this vector is going to be the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle that has length two and two. So the length of this vector is going to be the square root of this length squared plus this length squared. So we're going to have the square root of eight, so the square root of four plus four. And we can just write that down as two root two, and that will be the same length for the both of these. Now the overall magnitude uh, for the frequency response then, uh, we have to use uh, the properties that we discussed in the previous video. And for the magnitude at a given frequency, it's going to be the transfer function gain k. We didn't, I haven't discussed it here, but here the k would just be equal to one multiplied by the magnitudes of all the zero vectors, and then divided by the magnitudes of all the pole vectors. So we have a half divided by two root two, divided by two root two. So the these two here multiplied together would be equal to four times two, which is eight. So we have one half divided by eight, which is one sixteenth, which in decimal form is just 0 0.0625. So that gets us, that's our magnitude at the frequency zero. So this means that if you have a input to your system that's a DC signal, the magnitude of the output will be decreased by this factor. So if you have a magnitude uh, one in an input uh, signal, uh, you'll get an output um, signal also at the same frequency. So it'll also be a DC signal, but its magnitude would be one over 16. Okay, next up we have our frequency two. Uh, for frequency two, we're now gonna be considering this point up here. So our zero vector goes from here up to frequency two, and we have our two pole vectors. One of them will just be a horizontal line, and the other one will be a, um, 
a, a longer vector. Okay, so the three lengths that we have for the zero vector, now the zero vector length will be the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle that has length 0 0.5 and length 2. That's going to be the square root of 2 squared plus 0 0.5 squared. So in other words, the square root of 4.25. Pole 1, that's the pole up here. This one, uh, the vector is just going to have a length of 2. And then pole 2 is down here. It's going to be the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle with lengths 2 and 4. So it's going to be the square root of 4 plus 16, which is the square root of 20. And again, now for the overall transfer function magnitude, it's going to be transfer function gain, k, which here is just 1, um, multiplied by this square root of 4.25, and then divided by 2, and divided by the square root of 20. And if you do that in a calculator, or in your head if you really want to, uh, you'll get a value of 0 0.23, at least given to two significant figures. The third case now, for the frequency, we're thinking about the limit of the frequency as it tends to infinity. So these, obviously, these lengths will all be infinite. Um, but if we have, uh, depending on the number of poles and zeros, we can, we can deal with that. Now, because we have more poles than zeros, if we do this zero vector length divided by these two pole vector lengths, we're going to get um, a positive power of infinity in the denominator. So we can then write that the uh, the magnitude of the frequency response, as the frequency tends to infinity, is going to be equal to zero. Now, if you had a circumstance where you had equal numbers of poles and zeros, then you would need to apply something like lopes tells rule um, to figure out precisely what the actual gain should be. Um, in, in circumstances uh, for transfer functions, if you have an equal number of poles and zeros, as the frequency tends to infinity, the uh, transfer function magnitude should end up then just being equal to the transfer function gain k. Um, <clears throat> but in this case, we have more poles than zeros, so we end up with a magnitude of zero. Now, if we go to plot this, we've only we've only done three points, which isn't very many. But because we're doing this by hand, that's uh, that works out just fine for our cases. So we have here uh, x-axis will be our frequency, our y-axis will be the magnitude of h of omega. Make that stand out a bit more there. Um, this 0.23 is about 4 times equal to this uh, 1 over 16. So if I do at least two uh, data points here, I'll write this as 1 over 16. I'll write this as 0 0.23. Um, I'm not being particular here about the notation being consistent with decimal versus fractional form. Uh, this will be frequency 0. This will be frequency 2. So we know we have a data point here, and we have a data point here. It turns out if you were to keep um, finding additional frequency values, the actual peak of this curve would occur after frequency 2. So this is a curve that essentially goes up to here. It actually increases a bit further. And then it does, as, free, as the frequency goes up, this magnitude uh, then decreases asymptotically uh, towards 0. Now, we just found it for these uh, three test frequencies. So I'm not going to be particular about how I drew the rest of that. But if you were to work it out for more data points, you could come up with a more precise value. I'm going to show on screen now the actual um, equation for the magnitude for this particular transfer function, which you could work out if you were uh, really comfortable with the uh, complex uh, algebra. You can get a more detailed plot uh, from that. OK, I'm going to pause the solution right there since this example is taking a bit long to work out. So I'm creating separate videos for the magnitude and for the phase. Uh, for the system transfer function. Both the frequency and phase videos will come out at the same time, so if you watch one and want to find the other one, you should be able to quickly do that through my channel. Um, feel free to leave any feedback in the comments, and uh, subscribe if you're interested in catching more videos in this series. See you next time.